Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl Chapter 20 The Great Gum Machine Mr. Wonka led the party over to a gigantic machine that stood in the very center of the inventing room. It was a mountain of gleaming metal that towered high above the children and their parents. Out of the very top of it there sprouted hundreds and hundreds of thin glass tubes. And the glass tubes all curled downwards and came together in a bunch and hung suspended over an enormous round tub as big as a bath. Here we go! cried Mr. Wonka, and he pressed three different buttons on the side of the machine. A second later, a mighty rumbling sound came from inside it, and the whole machine began to shake most frighteningly, and steam began hissing out of it all over. And then, suddenly, the watchers noticed that runny stuff was pouring down the insides of all the hundreds of little glass tubes and squirting out into the great tub below. And in every single tube the runny stuff was of a different color, so that all the colors of the rainbow, and many others as well, came sloshing and splashing into the tub. It was a lovely sight. And when the tub was nearly full, Mr. Wonka pressed another button, and immediately the runny stuff disappeared and a whizzing whirling noise took its place and then a giant whizzer started whizzing round inside the enormous tub mixing up all the different colored liquids like an ice cream soda gradually the mixture began to froth it became frothier and frothier and it turned from blue to white to green to brown, to yellow, then back to blue again. Watch, said Mr. Wonka. Click went the machine, and the whizzer stopped whizzing. And now there came a sort of sucking noise, and very quickly all the blue frothy mixture in the huge basin was sucked back into the stomach of the machine. There was a moment of silence. Then, a few queer rumblings were heard, then silence again. Then suddenly the machine let out a monstrous mighty groan and at the same moment a tiny drawer, no bigger than the drawer in a slot machine, popped out of the side of the machine and in the drawer they lay something so small and thin and grey that everyone thought it must be a mistake. The thing looked like a little strip of grey cardboard. The children and their parents stared at the little grey strip lying in the drawer. You mean that's all? said Mike TV, disgust. That's all, answered Mr. Wonka, gazing proudly at the result. Don't you know what it is? There was a pause. Then suddenly, Violet Beauregard the silly gum-chewing girl let out a yell of excitement. By gum, it's gum, she shrieked. It's a stick of chewing gum. Right you are, cried Mr. Wonka, slapping Violet hard on the back. It's a stick of gum. It's a stick of the most amazing and fabulous and sensational gum in the world. Chapter 21 Goodbye, Violet this gum, Mr. Wonka went on, is my latest, my greatest, my most fascinating invention. It's a chewing gum mill. It's, 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 uh, that tiny little strip of gum lying there is a whole three-course dinner all by itself. What sort of nonsense is this? said one of the fathers. My dear sir, cried Mr. Wonka. When I start selling this gum in the shops, it will change everything. It will be the end of all kitchens and all cooking. 
there will be no more shopping to do, no more buying of meat and groceries. There will be no knives and forks at meal times, no plates, no washing up, no rubbish, no mess. Just a little strip of Wonka's magic chewing gum, and that's all you'll ever need at breakfast, lunch, and supper. This piece of gum I've just made happens to be tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie. But you can have almost anything you want. What do you mean it's tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie? said Violet Bourigaud. If you were to start chewing it, said Mr. Wonka, then that is exactly what you would get on the menu. It's absolutely amazing. You can actually feel the food going down your throat and into your tummy. And you can taste it perfectly. And it fills you up. It satisfies you. It's terrific. It's utterly impossible, said Veruca Salt. Just so long as it's gum, shouted Violet Bourigaud, just so long as it's a piece of gum and I can chew it, then that's for me. And quickly, she took her own world record piece of chewing gum out of her mouth and stuck it behind her left ear. Come on, Mr. Wonka, she said, hand over this magic gum of yours and we'll see if the thing works. Now, Violet, said Mrs. Bourigaud, her mother, don't let's do anything silly, Violet. I want the gum, Violet said obstinately. What's so silly? I would rather you didn't take it, Mr. Wonka told her gently. You see, I haven't got it quite right yet. There are still one or two things. Oh, two blazes with that, said Violet. And suddenly, before Mr. Wonka could stop her, she shot out a fat hand and grabbed the stick of gum out of the little drawer and popped it into her mouth. At once, her huge, well-trained jaws started chewing away on it like a pair of tongs. Don't, said Mr. Wonka. Fabulous, shouted Violet. It's tomato soup. It's hot and creamy and delicious. I can feel it running down my throat. Stop, said Mr. Wonka. The gum isn't ready yet. It's not right. Of course it's right, said Violet. It's working beautifully. Oh my, what lovely soup this is. Spit it out, said Mr. Wonka. It's changing, shouted Violet, chewing and green both at the same time. The second course is coming up. It's roast beef. It's tender and juicy. Oh boy, what a flavor! The baked potato is marvelous too. It's got a crispy skin and it's all filled with butter inside. But how interesting, Violet, said Mrs. Bourengard. You are a clever girl. Keep chewing, baby, said Mr. Bourengard. Keep right on chewing. This is a great day for the Bourengards. Our little girl is the first person in the world to have a chewing gum meal. Everybody was watching Violet Bourigaud as she stood there chewing this extraordinary gum. Little Charlie Bucket was staring at her absolutely spellbound, watching her huge rubbery lips as they pressed and unpressed with the chewing. And Grandpa Joe stood beside him, gaping at the girl, Mr. Wonka was wringing his hands and saying, No, 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 no! It isn't ready for eating! It isn't right! You mustn't do it! Blueberry pie and cream, shouted Violet. Here it comes! Oh my! It's perfect! It's beautiful! It's, it's exactly as though I'm swallowing it. It's as though I'm chewing and swallowing great big spoonfuls of the most marvelous blueberry pie in the world. Good heavens, girl, shrieked Mrs. Bourigaud suddenly, staring at Violet. What's happening to your nose? Oh, be quiet, mother, and let me finish, said Violet. It's turning blue, screamed Mrs. Bourigaud. Your nose is turning blue as a blueberry. 
Your mother is right, shouted Mr. Brigard. Your whole nose has gone purple. What do you mean, said Violet, still chewing away. Your cheeks, screamed Mrs. Brigard. They're turning blue as well. So is your chin. Your whole face is turning blue. Spit that gum out at once, ordered Mr. Brigard. Mercy, save us, yelled Mrs. Brigard. This girl's going blue and purple all over. Even her hair is changing color. Violet, you are turning violet. Violet, what is happening to you? I told you I hadn't got it quite right, sighed Mr. Wonka, shaking his head sadly. I'll say you haven't, cried Mrs. Bourgard. Just look at the girl now. Everybody was staring at Violet. And what a terrible, peculiar sight she was. Her face and hands and legs and neck, in fact the skin all over her body, as well as her great big mop of curly hair, had turned a brilliant purplish blue, the color of blueberry juice. It always goes wrong when we come to the dessert, sighed Mr. Wonka. It's the blueberry pie that does it. But I'll get it right one day. You wait and see. Violet, screamed Mrs. Brigard, you are swelling up. I feel sick, Violet said. You are swelling up, screamed Mrs. Brigard again. I feel most peculiar, gasped Violet. I'm not surprised, said Mr. Brigard. Great heavens, girl, screeched Mrs. Brigard. You are blowing up like a balloon. Like a blueberry, said Mr. Wonka. Call the doctor, shouted Mr. Brigard. Break her with a pin, said one of the other fathers. Save her, cried Mrs. Brigard, wringing her hands. But there was no saving her now. Her body was swelling up and changing shape at such a rate that within a minute it had turned into nothing less than an enormous round blue ball, a gigantic blueberry, in fact. And all that remained of Violet Brigard herself was a tiny pair of legs and a tiny pair of arms sticking out of the great round fruit and little head on top. It always happens like that, sighed Mr. Wonka. I've tried it twenty times in the testing room on twenty Oompa Loompas, and every one of them finished up as a blueberry. It's most annoying. I just can't understand it. But I don't want a blueberry for a daughter, yelled Mrs. Burigod. Put her back to what she was this instant. Mr. Wonka clicked his fingers, and ten Oompa Loompas appeared immediately at his side. Roll Miss Burigod into the boat, he said to them, and take her along to the juicing room at once. The juicing room, cried Mrs. Burigod. What are they going to do to her there? Squeeze her, said Mr. Wonka. We've got to squeeze the juice out of her immediately. After that, we'll just have to see how she comes out. But don't worry, my dear Mrs. Burigod. We'll get her repaired if it's the last thing we do. I'm sorry about it all. I really am. Already the ten Oompa Loompas were rolling the enormous blueberry across the floor of the inventing room towards the door that led to the chocolate river where the boat was waiting. Mr. and Mrs. Burigod hurried after them. The rest of the party, including little Charlie Bucket and Grandpa Joe, stood absolutely still and watched them go. Listen, whispered Charlie. Listen, Grandpa. The Oompa Loompas in the boat outside are starting to sing. The voices, one hundred of them singing together, came loud and clear into the room. Dear friends, we surely all agree, there is almost nothing worse to see than some repulsive little bum who's always chewing chewing gum. It's very near as bad as those 
who sit around and pick the nose. So please believe us when we say that chewing gum will never pay. The sticky habits bound to send the chewer to a sticky end. Did any of you ever know a person called Miss Bigelow? This dreadful woman saw no wrong in chewing, chewing all day long. She chewed while bathing in the tub. She chewed while dancing at her club. She chewed in church and on the bus. It really was quite ludicrous. And when she couldn't find her gum, she chewed up the linoleum or anything that happened near. A pair of boots, the postman's ear, or other people's underclothes. And once she chewed her boyfriend's nose. She went on chewing till at last her chewing muscles grew so vast that from her face her giant chin stuck out just like a violin. For years and years she chewed away, consuming fifty bits a day. Until one summer's eve, alas, a horrid business came to pass. Miss Bigelow went late to bed. For half an hour she lay and read, chewing and chewing all the while, like some great clockwork crocodile. At last she put her gum away, upon a special little tray, and settled back and went to sleep. She managed this by counting sheep. But now, how strange! Although she slept, those massive jaws of hers still kept on chewing, chewing through the night, even with nothing there to bite. They were, you see, in such a groove, they positively had to move. And very grim it was to hear, in picture darkness, loud and clear, this sleeping woman's great big trap, opening and shutting, snap, 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 faster and faster, chop, 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 the noise went on, it wouldn't stop, until at last her jaws decide to pause and open extra wide, and with the most tremendous chew, they bit the lady's tongue in two. Thereafter, just from chewing gum, Miss Bigelow was always dumb, and spent her life shut up in some disgusting sanatorium. And that is why we'll try so hard to save Miss Violet Beauregard from suffering an equal fate. She's still quite young. It's not too late, provided she survives the cure. We hope she does. We can't be sure. Chapter 22 Along the Corridor Well, well, well sighed Mr. Willy Wonka. Two naughty little children gone. Three good little children left. I think we'd better get out of this room quickly before we lose anyone else. But, Mr. Wonka, said Charlie Bucket anxiously, will Violet Beauregard ever be all right again, or will she always be a blueberry? They'll deduce her in no time flat, declared Mr. Wonka. They'll roll her into the deducing machine and she'll come out just as thin as a whistle. But will she still be blue all over? asked Charlie. She'll be purple, cried Mr. Wonka. A fine rich purple from head to toe. But there you are. That's what comes from chewing disgusting gum all day long. If you think gum is so disgusting, said Mike TV, then why do you make it in your factory? I do wish you wouldn't mumble, said Mr. Wonka. I can't hear a word you're saying. Come on, off we go. Hurry up, follow me. We're going into the corridors again. And so saying, Mr. Wonka scuttled across to the far end of the inventing room and went out through a small secret door hidden behind a lot of pipes and stoves. The three remaining children, Peruka Salt, Mike TV, and Charlie Bucket, 
together with the five remaining grown-ups, followed after him. Charlie Bucket saw that they were now back in one of those long pink corridors, with many other pink corridors leading out of it. Mr. Wonka was rushing along in front, turning left and right, and right and left, and Grandpa Joe was saying, Keep a good hold of my hand, Charlie. It would be terrible to get lost in here. Mr. Wonka was saying, No time for any more messing about. We'll never get anywhere at the rate we've been going. And on he rushed, down the endless pink corridors, with his black top hat perched on the top of his head, and his plum-colored velvet coattails flying out behind him like a flag in the wind. They passed a door in the wall. No time to go in, shouted Mr. Wonka. Press on, press on. They passed another door, then another, and another. They were doors every twenty paces or so along the corridor now, and they all had something written on them, and strange clanking noises were coming from behind several of them, and delicious smells came wafting through the keyholes, and sometimes little jets of colored steam shot out from the cracks underneath. Grandpa Joe and Charlie were half running and half walking to keep up with Mr. Wonka, but they were able to read what it said on quite a few of the doors as they hurried by. Eatable marshmallow pillows, it said on one. Marshmallow pills are terrific, shouted Mr. Wonka as he dashed by. They'll be all the rage when you get them into the shops. No time to go in, though. No time to go in. Lickable wallpaper for nurseries, it said on the next door. Lovely stuff, lickable wallpaper, cried Mr. Wonka rushing past. It has pictures of fruits on it. Bananas, apples, oranges, grapes, pineapples, strawberries, and snozberries. Snozberries, said Mike TV. Don't interrupt, said Mr. Wonka. The wallpaper has pictures of all these fruits printed on it. And when you lick the picture of a banana, it tastes of banana. When you lick a strawberry, it tastes of strawberry. And when you lick a snozberry, it tastes just exactly like a snozberry. But what does a snozberry taste like? You're mumbling again, said Mr. Wonka. Speak louder next time. On we go. Hurry up. Hot ice creams for cold days, it said on the next door. Extremely useful in the weather, said Mr. Wonka rushing on. Hot ice cream warms you up no end in freezing weather. I also make hot ice cubes for putting in hot drinks. Hot ice cubes make hot drinks hotter. Cows that give chocolate milk, it said on the next door. Ah, my pretty little cows, cried Mr. Wonka. How I love those cows. But why can't we see them? asked Viruka Salt. Why do we have to go rushing on past all these lovely rooms? We shall stop in time, called out Mr. Wonka. Don't be so madly impatient. Fizzy lifting drinks, it said on the next door. Oh, those are fabulous, cried Mr. Wonka. They fill you with bubbles, and the bubbles are full of a special kind of gas. And this gas is so terrifically lifting that it lifts you right off the ground, just like a balloon. And up you go until your head hits the ceiling. And there you stay. But how do you come down again? asked little Charlie. You do a burp, of course, said Mr. Wonka. You do a great, big, long, rude burp. And up comes the gas, and down comes you. But don't drink it outdoors. There is no knowing how high up you'll be carried if you do that. I gave some to an old Oompa Loompa once, out in the backyard. 
and he went up and up and disappeared out of sight. It was very sad. I never saw him again. He should have burped, Charlie said. Of course he should have burped, said Mr. Wonka. I stood there shouting, burp, you silly ass, burp, or you will never come down again. But he didn't, or couldn't, or wouldn't, I don't know which. Maybe he was too polite. He must be on the moon by now. On the next door it said, square sweets that look round. Wait, cried Mr. Wonka, skidding suddenly to a halt. I'm very proud of my square suits that look round. Let's take a peek. 